Good morning. The scripture reading today is in Job 11, verses 13 through 17. Yet if you devote your heart to him and stretch out your hands to him, if you put away the sin that is in your hand and allow no evil to dwell in your tent, then you will lift up your face without shame. You will stand firm and without fear. You will surely forget your troubles, recalling it only as waters gone by. Life will be brighter than noonday and darkness will become like morning. Lord, bless the words of this reading. Good morning. It's uh, good to be back here and uh, working on this series. Uh, the series, if you weren't here last week, is in uh, Matthew chapter 13. It's the parable of the sower. Um, last week was the healing seed, and the title of this message today is a surrendered heart. What does it take to know Jesus? What do you have? What do you have to know? Can you just know about Jesus and who he is? Is that good enough? What does it mean to be a believer in Jesus? All questions that can be answered in the parable of the sower. In the following scriptures, in this parable, we know that the soil is the heart of mankind and that the seed is the word of God. John says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God's holy word became alive and lived with us. How can this be? How can this be? Jesus is the word of God. Jesus was there at the beginning. Jesus is here now, and Jesus will be for all eternity. The word cannot be separ separated from Jesus. It is the very essence of God. And Jesus is revealed to us through his very word. The sower is the one who casts the, word, casts the word into the heart of mankind with the intention of tending it and allowing it to grow. The church is a sower of Jesus. I am a sower of Jesus. You are a sower of Jesus to a lost and dying world. The field is the world filled with hearts that are lost to God and are destined for an eternity separated from God, an eternity filled with nothing but darkness. But Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And John says, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and darkness is not overcome. The light that illuminates the heart of man has come into this world, and the seed scattered, the word of God, Jesus himself, will give life to those that have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts to understand. The seed is the key to eternal life with Jesus in heaven. Uh, if you would, turn with me to uh, Matthew 13, uh, 1 through 9. Matthew 13, 1 through 9. Matthew 13, 1 through 9. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him, and he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good ground, where it protected a crop, where it produced a crop, 160 or 30 times what was sown. Whoever have ears, let them hear. The first soil, 
the first soil. It was a hard path. You know, in those days, you had plants, and, and we, do, we still do it today. We, we don't step on our plants in the field, right? We don't do that. We, we walk on the path. And as farmers and, and harvesters and tenders walk that path, that path becomes really hard. Sometimes we even line it with rocks so it doesn't turn muddy, right? And so the sower is out there in the field and he's scattering the seed and some of it falls on this path. <clears throat> it's a hard path. The place in the field that is packed hard by the feet of the farmer. The seed cannot penetrate the hardness of this soil. It just lays on top. The soil must be tilled to allow the seed to germinate. Everyone knows that if I go outside right now and scatter grass seed on the parking lot, it's not going to grow. There's energy in the seed and, you know, it might get a little bit of water. The sun might come out and warm it up when the spring comes and it might try to put out a root, but it doesn't have enough energy in that seed to push through a hard black top. Doesn't have it, does it? You got to break up the black top, get to the dirt and then scatter the seed. Right? We all know that. That's the point of what Jesus is trying to talk about. So what's the first soil? It's the heart of the hearer. Remember, the seed is the word. The seed is the word of God. The seed is Jesus himself. And the soil are the different hearts of mankind. There's four of them. We need to know this because when we're out in the world scattering seed, we need, to, we need to know which heart we're scattering to, which heart we're speaking to. The first soil is the heart of the hearer, a very hard packed heart with no fissures for the seed to take root, no place for the seed to fall into, no cover for the seed. It's a hardened heart. A heart that's been hardened by the world. A heart that's been hardened by tribulations. We've all met these people. People that we love, but can't see any point in Jesus Christ or the church. A very hard packed heart. It is a heart that hears a message about the kingdom and dismisses it immediately. Why do I need that? I don't need Jesus. You guys are weird for going to church. Why do you do that? Have you heard that before? I have. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to be here. What's that all about? Why do I even need that? You see, it's dismissed immediately. And what Jesus says is that the birds come and snatch it away. It's a heart that doesn't understand the message and he has no desire to understand the message. It's a heart that needs to be softened. It needs to be tilled. A heart that needs to be fertilized. Then the seed will take root. Many of us read about this first heart, a hard heart. And when we meet someone like it in the world, as we're scattering the seed, the message, the message of the kingdom of heaven, we dismiss that person as fast as they dismiss the work. Many of us do that. It's a mistake. The heart of this person needs to be softened. How do we soften the heart of this person? Good question, right? How do we do it? Well, we have an example. It was Jesus himself in this world. How do we soften the heart of this person? First, we take up our cross and follow Jesus. You see, if my life is all concerned about what's going on in the world, and my life is all concerned about the problems and things that I have, I'm not focused on Jesus. And if I'm not focused on Jesus, there's no way that I can reach someone for Jesus. So the very first thing is to lay down our lives for Jesus, the same way he did it for us. It's the very same thing that we must do. We must first take up our cross and follow him. We put our lives on hold and get to know this person. Jesus had relationships with people. He met people. He talked to people. We need to put our lives on hold and get to know this person. 
We become acquaintances with this person. Just an acquaintance. Hi, how you doing? I'm so-and-so. How's the weather today? Then we begin to have conversations with this person. And then we become friends with this person. What does Jesus say about friends? What does he say? He says, there's no greater love than this. Then when one, then one, one lays down his life for his friends. How did Jesus soften the hearts of those people that, that met him? First, he showed an amazing grace. Jesus says, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. I came into the world to save it. It's the same attitude we need to have. We can't have an attitude of condemnation out in the world, even though we know it's wrong. We know that the things that are going on aren't right, but we can't have an attitude of con condemnation. The world is condemned already. John 3, 17. For I sent my son into the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world because the world is condemned already. So grace could flow from Jesus. Grace did flow from Jesus. A grace that has never been seen before. A grace that could only come from Jesus. A grace that is given to every sower of the seed. A grace that fills our hearts and a grace that shows in our lives. Right? You want to touch a hard heart? Be grace to that person. Because what happens is, they don't understand why you would be that way because it's so contradictory to the way that they feel that it brings a question into their mind. And that question becomes, why is this person so different? And then you can make the answer because of Jesus, right? How did Jesus soften the hearts of people that he met? He showed them love. That's a hard one. How do you love someone who hates you? How do you love someone who has nothing in common with you? Jesus did it. He showed them love. He didn't only show love. He was love in their lives. He was love in their lives. So here's a person with a hard heart that doesn't really know you. He doesn't know anything about Jesus. And he's... he's he doesn't want anything to do with you, but you're over there raking his lawn or you're over there saying, hey, man, can I mow your, mow your yard for you? Can I help you out? Right. You become friends and then you go out to lunch and then you start talking. And he knows that there's something different. And when his back hurts, you go over there and carry his groceries in. That's love. That's love for someone who you don't know. It's love for someone who has a hard heart, who doesn't believe the same things that you believe. But Jesus did it. Why did he go to the cross? Why did he have tears when he came down the Mount of Olives and looked at Jerusalem? Why did he weep at Lazarus' tomb? It's because he was filled with love for people that didn't know the kingdom of God, and it broke his heart. <clears throat> He didn't only show love, he was love in their lives. By being the very essence of love, Jesus poured out love on people, which is what we need to do. You know, we look at the world today and we say, well, the world's pretty broken, right? Just watch the news, it's busted. I mean, it, it needs fixed big time. You know what? I can't fix the world. But I have a message that can save someone's heart. And you do too. You have a message that can save someone's heart. Every one of us sitting here. And the more hearts that are saved, the more the world changes. That's the whole point of being a Christian. That's the whole point of believing in Jesus Christ. That's the whole point of knowing that we're going to an eternity in a beautiful place called heaven. That's the point. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, if I have not love, I am nothing. I'm paraphrasing the whole Chapter 13, if I have not love, I am nothing. 
Nothing. I could come to church. I could play the piano. Not, not pick an age, you know. You know, I could stand here in the pulpit and preach a message. But if I'm not loved, I am no use to Jesus Christ, and I am no use to the, the kingdom of God. And my message won't bear fruit. My message won't plant seed that grows a crop 160 or 30 fold. We'll do it. If we're not loved in the world around us, we cannot be an effective sower of the seed. But if the love of Jesus flows from our hearts into the hearts of those around us, then, then the heart of the hearer begins to crack and fissures form and the seed begins to take root and the heart starts to surrender to Jesus. That's the answer. A surrendered heart. A surrendered heart. If we don't pick up our cross, let grace flow from our soul and be loved to those around us, we're like the birds who come and steal the seed. We are actually helping the evil one to steal the word from the hearer and have added to the hardness of their hearts. But if the sower sows the seed of life in the full power and glory of Jesus himself, the evil one has no chance at removing the seed. If you would, it's Matthew 13, and Jesus explains this parable. This is a really easy parable because Jesus explains it, right? So if we go to 13, 18, his disciples ask him, what does this parable mean? And he says in 18, listen then to what the parable of the sower means, 13, 18. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. You see, the, our battle is not, it's not with people. It's not with hard hearts. Our battle is with the evil one. When you become a believer in Jesus Christ, my battle isn't, isn't with my wife about what we're having for dinner, or, or my battle isn't about uh, um, how much I have to pay to have a tire change, right? My battle's with Satan himself. That's my battle, okay? And when we look at it, the world that way, then we can love the world because it's not the world that's hurting us. It's not the people that have hard hearts. It's not those people that are hurting us. It's Satan himself. See the difference? See the difference? Then we come to the second soil. I'm going to do two soils this week. And I'll do the final two next week. We come to the second soil. It's a little bit different. It's rocky ground has very little topsoil. The seed starts to grow in the shallow soil. But when the sun comes up, it can't get enough water, it can't get enough nutrients, and the plant, it starts to wilt, right? What happens to your flower pots that are hanging out in the sun and you don't add water, right? They kind of fall over. They add water and then they grow back up. If you don't add water soon enough, they don't regrow. I know that. Paul has been upset at me about that many times. But you have to have soil for that water to catch, right? So the plant can sustain itself through the, the hot summer days. So what's the second soil? The seed starts to grow in shallow soil. The roots only go down until they hit the hard rock and can't break through. What is the second soil? It's the heart of someone who hears the word and believes it. The heart of someone who hears the word and believes it. Amen. The heart of someone who only hears the word but doesn't go any further with it. Right? Many times... And in many missions, we're out there and we're scattering the seed, we're scattering the seed, we're baptizing people, we're doing all this, right? There's nothing in the background that's supporting it. 
So it's really easy for a person like this to have very shallow roots, right? Well, they came to Jesus, but that's all they really know, right? A heart that won't surrender to the power of Jesus or doesn't know it needs to. One or the other. A heart that won't surrender to the power of Jesus. It's a surrendered heart is the key to this whole thing, right? We have to have surrendered hearts even as believers, right? A heart that won't surrender to the power of Jesus or doesn't know that it needs to surrender. A heart that is concerned about what the world thinks. Go with me to uh, 13, uh, what is it, 20? Yeah, 20, 13, 20. Jesus talks about it. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. Now here's the, here's the explanation. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. What is it that the, the evil one most desires. He most desires that God's seed doesn't grow. So I will tell you that the day that I got saved, it was a Sunday. I accepted Jesus into my heart. And Monday morning, I was at work in Eastlake. And two Mormon uh, uh, fellows came to the job site. And they were telling me how... Uh, in John 3, 16, it says, uh, for God so loved the world uh, that he sent his only begotten son so that whosoever believeth in him um, should not perish but have everlasting life. And their big crux was the should, should not perish. And we had a conversation that was probably about an hour long. And uh, I think they left shaking their heads because I was like on fire for the Lord, man. Okay. I mean, that's what happens, right? We go out and you, and you get saved. Okay. It's amazing. All right. And I mean, it was a good conversation, but there was no way that I was going to go and, and believe that I had to do works to come to Christ because I had just done it. Right. And I had a great opportunity to, to share my faith with them. But what I'm trying to say is when someone comes to the Lord, Satan's going to try to attack them, right? They're filled with joy and you're filled with power, but there's, there's a lot of things that are broken and a lot of things that aren't going to get fixed right away. And what Jesus is saying is when trouble and persecution comes because of the word, why are you going to church? You know, Paul, I got saved first. And I'm saying, why do you go to church? What do you got to go there for? Well, because I love Jesus, what she's saying. That's why I'm telling you, that's why you need to come to church because you love Jesus. But it's easy to have someone say, well, why do you do that? What are you doing that for? Why don't you come and watch the football game? No, you have to work on Sunday morning. I'm sorry. Those are all things that happen in the world, right? But remember, our battle is not with our boss that says that we can't work, that we have to work on Sunday morning. Our battles with Satan himself. That's what Jesus is saying here. The persecution doesn't come from Jesus. It doesn't come from the kingdom of God. It comes from the world that's lost already. A heart that is concerned about what the world thinks. That's interesting. Many times we get our adoration from the world. Right? Uh, we get our joy from the world. And even though we accept Jesus and we're filled with joy... Really, our joy comes from the things of the world. Okay, and that's the challenge. Jesus says in Matthew, so what does the world think? Jesus says in Matthew 10, 22, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Wow. And in the book of John, he says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you, were, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. 
Okay, you see, we love, humankind loves its own, right? But that's not really what Jesus' love is all about. It's not loving our own. It's loving those that don't really like us at all. And that's what changes hearts. That's what changes the world. That's what's going to change the world on that great day when Jesus is seen in the clouds, on that great day when Jesus comes back, on the great day when the blood runs bridal deep in the valley of Mekita. Jesus says those things that the world hates us to, to make us know that we're not of the world, that we're different. But we need to understand that also to everyone that we're scattering the seed to, because they don't know that. They don't understand that. And it's easy for us to judge and say, well, you know, they really didn't believe. No, I believe they believe. He says it right here. They believe. But the trials pulled them away from Jesus and pulled them away from God. This is a heart that needs compliments and adoration from the world. If we look to the world for our satisfaction, why do we need Jesus? There will be no room in our hearts for Jesus if our treasures are of this world. When we scatter the seed in the field of the earth, we plant the word of God, Jesus himself, into the heart of mankind. We cannot forget that all hearts are not the same and that all desires are not the same. If we just scatter the seed and move on, we may rejoice as heaven rejoices at the baptism of one soul. We may praise Jesus at the work he is doing in our ministry. We may also lose that person to the world that hates us. Interesting, huh? I've been asked many times, why do I need to go to church? It's the very answer to the dilemma of having no root. We must make the kingdom of God big in our lives, and we must make worldly desires small in our lives. And how do we do that? If we have fellowship with other believers... We build a group that can stand against the temptation of the evil one. We build a group that can stand against the temptation of the evil one. Do you realize that's what this church is about? That's what it's about. We can't do our ministry in the world out there on our own. There's no way. We have power against, over Satan. We have power over the evil one. But man, it'll wear us out fighting them by ourselves. It will. That's why you need the church. That's why we're here. We can share in each other's burdens and grow strong together. We can share in each other's triumphs and build a great house filled with the power of Jesus. See, we don't only, only share in the triumphs. We share in others, other people's burdens, right? That's why we have our corporate prayer. That's why we sit here, and that's why we talk in Sunday school about, oh, boy, I'm having this trouble, or I'm having that trouble, right? That's why we go to dinner and, and talk about those things. We share in those burdens, and it strengthens each one of us because we know that other people are struggling also just the same way that we are, and that there's a great power, Jesus Christ, that can cure all that. And we're not alone. See, the one thing that Satan wants is for you to be alone. So one thing he wants because he knows if he pulls you out of the church, even though you're a believer, even though you're going to go to heaven, he pulls you out of the church, you're not doing the ministry for God, he wins. That's the battle. He wins. If we study the word together, we will grow our roots deep in the pages of scripture where wind cannot uproot us and knock us down. Where hail will not damage our leaves where fire will not burn our stock, where good fruit will ripen for the glory of the king. If we study the word together, the world and fleshy desires have no place in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is, is up there, right? 
or the kingdom of God is in this church, right? No. No. The kingdom of God is inside every one of you that says Jesus is your Lord. That's where the kingdom of God is, and that's what draws us together as a church. The kingdom of God is in the hearts of everyone who calls Jesus by name. A powerful, unstoppable, insurmountable kingdom that reigns in our hearts for eternity with Jesus as its king. Eternity with Jesus as its king. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. I can't believe it happened to me. Can't believe it happened to me. Jesus says, that if you confess my name before men, I will confess your name to my Father. Today, if you've heard the word and didn't understand it, surrender your heart. You came to the right place. This church, a place filled with grace, a place filled with mercy, and a place filled with the love of Jesus. Let that love seep deep into your heart and make a place for the message of the kingdom of, of heaven, a place for King Jesus to rule. Today, if you struggle with the desires and tribulations of this world, surrender your heart. Surrender your heart to Jesus. You came to the right place. This church, it's where the word is taught and the scriptures are read where the community of believers shares in each other's troubles and achievements, where love will fill your heart and grace will fill your soul. There's a reason for scattering the seed of life. It's to see that seed grow and produce fruit. All the types of soil with the proper care and surrender can grow seed to produce an abundant crop. First, you must decide to surrender your heart to Jesus. Then you must decide to be a part of this church so that your life will bear good fruit for the kingdom of God. And in the end, you hear the words, by, words spoken by Jesus himself. Well done, good and faithful servant. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we stand here today as believers in your son, Lord. Lord, we just ask that you soften our hearts so that we may surrender to you today, so that we may be your, your love in this world, so that we may be grace to those around us, so that your seed may be scattered from us, so that you will make us a great sower of the word of the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we ask this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. <laughs>